Annual in April National Farmers Organization Convention 1980, a special news meeting, Tim Minnes, Director of Speaking. Good afternoon, everyone who's come to the Sunflower meeting. I'd like to start it off with a moment of silent prayer. If you'd all stand, please. Amen. I'd like to start out our meeting today by making some introductions of people who many of you already know, but I'd like to do it as a form of special recognition for the important and good job they've been doing with the Specialties Division throughout the days and weeks of the year, the continual efforts to sign up production and so forth. I'd like to start off by introducing Bob Lewis, who's been in charge of working in the North St. Paul and the Minnesota side of the Bemidji marketing area in the last year. He's been doing a lot of work as far as sign up of acres at meetings and on an individual basis. And we'll be continuing to work in that same general area in the areas of recruiting new sunflowers and uh, servicing the producers that are in the program now. I'd like to introduce Delton Minder, who works with us in the Sioux Falls marketing area, and uh, he's been in charge of uh, the sign up of the acres there and servicing the members in that area. And we've had uh, some nice, particularly good follow up of last year's seminars done by Delton, and also uh, good contact work with uh, producers who owed $150 dues recently and getting a number of them into the program. So we appreciate that. And finally, Warren Doubles from uh, Fergus Falls, Minnesota has been working throughout the past year primarily in the North Dakota area and more recently during the delivery period has been at the West Fargo office answering uh, delivery calls and problem calls, working with coordination in one of the uh, toughest falls that we've had as far as keeping a spot to deliver at uh, the Duluth Superior Point every day and we've done a, uh, quite a job as far as uh, being able to switch around on a day-to-day -day basis and try to always have one place to deliver. We've been shut down for some periods but I want to th uh, thank these people for the good job that they have done all year and we're looking forward to another one. I'd like to start off by making a few remarks about a booklet that I've done some reading in, and I was impressed by one thing and only want to make a, a short point about it, but from time to time we get booklets that have studies about agriculture in them, and I don't think that this is particularly um, significant nationally or anything like that, except that I was amazed to see and hear the common agreement among producers, whether they were members of any of the major farm organizations or not members of any organizations, in terms of what the farm problem is, what the solution is, what the causes are, and those types of things. And uh, the conclusion that I reached from this is that there's pretty common agreement on all of that. It's just it, people are up to the level of having fairly common agreement on in all of those areas, and it's just a matter of us uh, selling our programs to the point of getting them in and, and getting uh, one year's good experience under their belt and uh, increasing our numbers. I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to show you some of the graphs that this particular person uh, put together in this study. She was studying uh, really off of the American agriculture movement uh, why various farmers supported what they were doing and she set up graphs of how they compared and sympathized with those people who were in the American agriculture movement and of course many times 
people were in multiple groups. They were members of all of the farm organizations and act, considered themselves active members in that movement. So I'd like to just take a minute to show you some of the graphs that she had in there. In terms of defining the farm problem, they had um, the percent of the sample that was in agreement, high production costs, low farm prices, cost price squeeze, all related of course, other not sure, too much food, uh, too much food produced, there is no problem. Too much food produced and there is no problem, you got 4%. You got uh, everybody grouped up in the high production costs, low farm prices, farm or cost price squeeze, all that area. There's there's not any major disagreement, all in the same ballpark. Then the, the interesting thing is that she did some graphs that separated out by individual farm organizations. Um, here's the cause of the farm problem. Farm Bureau members compared to non-members in this particular group, only in Kansas now, cause of uh, farm problem. Prices have not kept up with cost of production, 81 percent, non-members 85 percent. Very close coordination between the people in that group and the non-members the non considered. Uh, inefficient management by some farmers is down in the range of 17 percent for Farm Bureau members, 10 percent for non-members as the cause of the farm problem. Government income Support prices, 16 and 13, relatively low numbers. Too much production, 13, 8. Too many farmers, 1% in each category. Very, very, very small number. The same kind of a comparison with uh, the NFO members in the group. And uh, the percentages running in a very similar way. Too few exports, I guess, would be smaller, inefficient management by farmers. Um, that would be a lower figure than the non-members considered as a group, 9% for NFO members, 16 for the non-members. But I think the overall picture here is common agreement when you compare all of these, these groups on this particular point. Even more interesting as you get into another area of question, who is responsible for the farm problem? This is from the general sample. You see there are 36 percent farmers themselves. Get this up here a little bit. Can you read those numbers from out there or are they not visible? Okay, far, uh, the choices were farmers themselves, 36 percent, trilateral commission, 26 percent, corporations generally 25, food processors 23, other 20. Now they answered, they could have more than one answer in this. Grain dealers, 19 percent said that. Foreign ownership of land and business, 19 percent. Government interference, 17 percent. Banks, 8 percent. Don't know, don't wish to say, 8 percent. Feelings on who's responsible for the farm problem, highly important and significantly the top one, 36 percent farmers themselves, a recognition of the fact that they have uh, something to play in solving the farm problem or at least being responsible for it, uh, some responsibility f placed on themselves. Then doing the same type of a thing as I did on the other question, splitting out the who is responsible for the farm problem opinions of NFO members compared to non-members. Farmers themselves way higher, 60 percent, trilateral commission 48 percent, corporations in general 27, grain dealers 20, food processors and so on down the line, uh, foreign ownership um, 10 percent at the bottom of the list and uh, significantly different from the uh, 31 percent for the non-members. 
And uh, apparently the NFO members named more reasons because their, all of their percentages are higher and they could name more than one reason. Here you have uh, responsibility, uh, responsibility for the farm problem. Farm Bureau members compared to NFO members. 32% uh, farmers themselves compared to 50% from the total sample. Corporations in general, food processors and so on down the line. Trilateral commission 21%. Significant uh, that farmers themselves is the highest one in that case. And the third area of question was the solution to the farm problem. Have target prices and loan rates at cost of production plus a reasonable profit was the top one uh, as far as mentioned. Cost of production plus a reasonable profit, 56%. Controlled marketing. Controlled marketing through collective bargaining, a very high percentage, 46%. Uh, use bushels rather than acre controls to get prices at or near parity, 42%. Use a yearly orderly marketing program, 40%. Controlled marketing through cooperatives, 39%. Have prices fixed at 90% of parity, 26%. Enter into regional marketing agreements and compacts, 25%. Use holding actions or strikes, 25%. All of those a significant percentage, all of them relating to concepts uh, that NFO has been and is the leader in, particularly program marketing, orderly marketing, that type of, uh, that's the leader uh, as far as solutions. Now I suppose the first one could, could be considered having someone else do it, uh, target prices and loan prices, loan rates at cost of production plus a reasonable profit, that being number one. But a series of a number of them come in right behind there and all of them relate into uh, seeing a need for solving the prog farm program with the types of things that we're doing every day in our programs. Solution to the farm problem. Um, the percentages Farm Bureau members compared to non-members whether they favor or oppose these different items that were on my previous transparency there. And uh, some significant differences in the percentages, but the order of things is very, uh, very similar. One that would be significant here is controlled marketing through collective bargaining. The sample in general said 62% uh, named that as solution to the farm problem. Uh, compared to 40% in the controlled sample as far as the uh, members of the Farm Bureau. The same type of information in regard to opinions of NFO members compared to non-members. Um, interesting here that controlled marketing through collective bargaining as it should be is 85%. They believe in that, and of course that's why they've become members of NFO, so that significantly reverses the order here, but the percentages are high in every case. My point with this is not to particularly say that this article has tremendous value, but to recognize the thing that we're seeing out there every day is that there's common agreement of what we need to do and the agreement of what we need to do fits right in with what we are doing in NFO. It's just a job of selling more people on the idea and getting, getting them into the program. I'd like to take a few minutes now to just review our program and our goals for the coming year. Our latest figures, we've been delivering our fall block of sunflowers, and these figures would represent the different delivery points that we've delivered to for IS Joseph Company on our fall block. We've had to switch around from one point to another to deliver for IS Joseph Company into different places. 
at uh, GTA we've in uh, Superior we've delivered 565 metric ton at Cargill not quite 700 metric ton 698 metric ton at uh, Pillsbury at St. Paul now uh, 17,000 metric ton for IS Joseph at Continental 6,435 ton and to Great Lakes uh, before we had the difficulty of them having to close down with problems there, 9,665 ton. We have now delivered and filled our existing contracts, our uh, forward contracts, and are now selling out on the balance of as they come in to complete the fall block. As far as sign up for next year, we have a total of 48,000 acres signed up at this point for 1981. This is very similar to our position a year ago in terms of sign up. Significant difference is that many of those acres are also signed up for four years into the future, which uh, wasn't the case one year ago today. That breaks down in the Bemidji marketing area about 14,000 acres, uh, Bismarck 16,000 acres, Sioux Falls 13,000 acres, 1,500 acres in the North St. Paul marketing area, Bloomfield 320, the Flint marketing area in Michigan 390, and the Great Falls marketing area in Montana right now 560 acres. These are the acre figures signed up for the 1981 block for delivery fall of next year. We have a small start on the spring delivery, which would be 81 crop flowers to deliver in the spring of 82. And a significant difference in where we're at today compared to two or three years ago, of course, is that in addition to the most significant part of our production, the fall block, we have been and have had this past year a significant spring block of flowers delivered on the same type of a program with an average price going to the producers and also from the time of January 1st through September 1st we will be making spot sales for people who have sunflowers in the bend that aren't committed to anyone in any other direction we've been selling out spot sales throughout the year and will continue to do that with the exception of during the period when we're delivering and paying and concentrating on our fall block, which would be the last quarter of the year. Then we are not making any spot sales and we are not, uh, it's not in the best interest of the program at this time to try to be handling spot sales during the volume that we have at that time. In regard to our goals for next year, We've talked about those uh, some out in the individual areas. We're going to be tied very closely together in cooperation with the grain department and them trying to put together enough volume to have satellite offices. Some of them are already started. Some of them are being talked about. We're going to have clo close coordination with them. We're going to be servicing and signing up grain in some areas where they do not have staff. They are going to be uh, servicing sunflowers in the sense of coordinating and signing up in those areas that are black lined for uh, satellite offices. So it'll expand the capabilities of both departments I believe and, and should be a benefit to all of us. We have made arrangements that within the next 30 days we will have a new NFO sunflower cap that we're going to give out as a promotion for those people signed up five years into the program. We're going to start a drive to get a thousand people signed up for five years into the program. Now this can be, this doesn't limit people to the fall block. They can be either in the, in the fall block or the spring block and uh, in either case sign up acres for those uh, five-year periods and we're going to shoot to get a thousand people into that uh, position. I believe there's about 
35 or 40,000 acres right now that are already signed up for multiple years, five years. The other thing that uh, some of you have heard about working with Bob and Delton is that we're going to be going through the counties with a plat book and trying to identify significant producers outside of NFO and call them, try to screen them down to the most interested and then do personal contacts on them. So we're going to try and canvas the whole area, go after a lot more new members and I believe that uh, at 300,000 acres uh, we can make some significant improvements in the program. As you know and many of you met him before, um, Al Virgin of IS Joseph Company has been with us before and I'd like to call on him now to say a few words in regard to our delivery activities. Thank you, Tim. Delegates, members, and guests of the National Farmers Organization, I thank you again for inviting me to your convention. It's always a pleasure for me to come here and review the past experiences we've had and plan new goals for the future. Speaking about the past, I know your department here had a transition just like your organization did last year in leadership. We worked very well at the IS Joseph Company with Shelley Robertson, but I feel it's a real tribute to Tim and his staff that the, to continue the success that the Sunflower Seed Program has, has done this year. It's been extremely smooth, and uh, I do believe his staff really deserves a good round of applause. I don't have any one-liners for you this year except to say that uh, Great Lakes Storage and Contracting has received an award in the last six weeks <laughs> for the most efficiency in unloading trucks. Not one truck has waited up there over 15 minutes. As Tim noted before, there were problems with deliveries this year, serious problems. Many times there were not places to deliver seeds. And I want to say that uh, over 90% of our sunflower seeds come from you producers, your organization. And we have had far less problems with getting that 90% delivered than the balance of it. It seems that the 10% that we do not get from your organization, we have problems every year and end up with arbitrations or court cases. And I really thank you and appreciate that. To continue this success, your staff and our people are going to sit down after the first of the year and try to get more deeply involved in the management and the, or the financial posture of these delivery points. Because as Tim mentioned, your organization is planning five years in advance. We want to get involved in that and plan five years in advance also. Because it's the timeliness of executing contracts that gets you the highest prices. Anybody can make a contract, but if you can't deliver upon it, and you don't deliver the quality, you lose that customer. So this is the secret to success, and with your planning and your deliveries, it has gone successful. Because there's a hungry world out there to feel, feed. As you know, your sunflower seeds traditionally go to Germany, Holland, France, Portugal. Well, this past year, uh, you may have asked yourself, what the heck is you gonna, what are we gonna do with uh, 17,000 ton of sunflower seeds going down the river. Well, those will be loaded in a couple of weeks and they'll be on their way to the west coast of Mexico. Because you delivered into Minneapolis-St. Paul, you were able to take advantage of the Mexican market. Last year, I also reported that we sold a cargo of sunflower seeds to Nigeria, which is on the west coast of Africa. At your convention last year, the ship was sitting in the uh, harbor at Lagos. However, I kind of stretched the truth. That ship did not discharge there. This particular gentleman had arranged to have a vacuvator unload 14,500 ton of sunflower seeds. And you know how sunflower seeds flow through a vacuvator. Not too successfully. It's like trying to clean a haymow with a vacuum cleaner. So, Anyway, out of the 14,500, only about 164 ton were unloaded in five days. I calculated it out that it would have taken a year and a quarter for him to unload that ship. <laughs> I believe they need an NFO office in Lagos. So anyway, this particular gentleman came to us and we had to resell the cargo and we fi finally ended up in Italy. 
So it again shows flexibility that we do have in this market. Being dedicated to the export market and having these facilities, there is also another market that exists, and that's the domestic market. Two years ago, Mr. Joseph made a presentation to you that we were looking into the feasibility of building a uh, sunflower seed crushing plant. This kind of got shelved due to some problems and delays. In the last 30 days, it's gone full speed again. I would say I'm 75% sure that in the next uh, 60 days, we'll be making an announcement as to location and starting construction time. And again, we you're going to be very important to us in that project also because we are going to be counting on your organization very heavily to supply sunflower seeds to us. I, again, want to thank you for your support. And as I've indicated, I.S. Joseph Company is dedicated to sunflower seeds. It's very important to our organization, and you're extremely important to us. As always, I'll be around after the meeting for any comments, suggestions, pies in the face, or donuts in the ears, whatever may exist. So I'm going to turn the meeting back to Tim because we've got to hear about world markets, and I'm really going to take notes because I want to know what to do in the future. Randy. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Al. Uh, there is one area that Al and I had discussed a year ago. I saw some figures on the tonnages of sunflowers that left Minneapolis-St. Paul went down the river by barge and it was 22,000 ton for the fall delivery period and I knew that we had delivered 7,000 ton to IS Joseph Company which was a pretty nice percentage of that and I was quite frankly surprised by the figures. I brought that up to Al recently and he said that we're about the only ones that are moving any down the River, that being I.S. Joseph and a majority of their, that being our flowers. Uh, Al, did you have any idea what? Uh, 75% percent of the sunflowers that are moving out by barge are ours. There's only one other company that's doing anything by barge out of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Other area I think it's important for me to comment on this at this point, and that is that generally we're dealing with three or four major buyers and a sig the next most significant buyer after IS Joseph Company is uh, Continental Grain. We're doing a quite a bit of business with them at Superior Wisconsin. As you know we sell to ADM and we also have uh, sold to International Multi Foods and basically those are the companies that we've been able to uh, work out the best uh, sales with at the each particular time and we do have a nice mix of uh, sales with uh, three to four companies on each of our our blocks and uh, quite a number of sales. I'd also like to say as far as um, any area of questions with us getting started late and so forth we'll would be glad to try and handle questions uh, hopefully afterwards when we go into this hospitality meeting after after we have our main speaker also I'll be having a meeting at uh, 3 30 in this same room listed in your program as a general meeting and we'll want to catch and handle anything that people need service with or haven't had an opportunity to discuss uh, in any of these other meetings, particularly those people interested in uh, some of the other commodities that we can't possibly ha have a meeting for every commodity like buckwheat or hay or or some of those other commodities that we're in are invited to that meeting. We specifically have a meeting at 4.30 to do some work on millet. Okay, with those announcements I'd like to introduce our guest speaker and give a little background. First of all, I'd like to say that when you have a working relationship with any of the buyers, they are a good source of information to you, and we have our own good sources of information. Uh, there's as many different opinions on what markets are going to do and what the factors mean as there are people giving the opinions. 
But in any case, there has to be some analysis that goes into that. And one of the things that we've done is that we've formed a consulting relationship with a new young firm that we consider to be independent and we like what they're putting out in the form of their publications and so forth. And we formed a, a consulting relationship with a company called RWA Financial Services of, located in Davenport, Iowa. The speaker I'm about to do, introduce is the president of that company. His background, uh, along with having been born and raised in Iowa and having some farm contacts and roots there, in 1973, he was a grain merchandiser with Rosenberger Company, or Rosenberger Grain, rather, of Des Moines, Iowa. In 1975, he became the manager of the specialties department and assistant manager of the grain department for farmers' grain and livestock based in Des Moines, Iowa, dealing with uh, market information and an analysis of market uh, factors. In 1978, after some experience and travel on the road and speaking, working with that company, he formed his own firm, RWA Financial Services Incorporated. He is the president and he is also the editor of Sunflower World Magazine and a report called the Specialty Report. He deals very much in the same areas and commodities that our own specialty departments finds a need for information in. Randy Allen offers his professional commodity skills uh, to the industry and financial institutions. He's held seminars at the requests of banks. He uh, also uh, sells his information in a client service program to individual producers. But the background, the psychology, and all, all the things that he is promoting in his book, that type of information applied to a group like ours where we have collective bargaining strength to go beyond and, and complement the use of information uh, makes it uh, one additional step and we believe that um, the members of our program are entitled to significant outside uh, market analysis information being applied to what we're doing with the program for all of the members as a group. He has instructed commodity and hedging seminars, as I said, and has dealt with prospective, ex uh, prospective export deals in the Middle East, particularly before the recent war that's going on there now. With that background information, I'd like to introduce Randall Allen, president of RWA Financial Services, uh, to speak to you in regard to sunflowers and marketing psychology. Thank you very much. I'm excited about this. I'm excited about the NFO and more excited than ever to be here. I uh, was mentioning in the dry bean meeting today that I was impressed with Tim Ennis and his staff. Tim uh, modestly said afterwards, I wish you wouldn't build me up like that. And uh, Tim, I'm sorry about that, but I am impressed. I guess I'm impressed for one of the reasons Tim brought up, and that is, is that I think the farmer is the backbone of the country, and we're sitting in a farmer-owned building right now in the middle of Cincinnati. This ground was discovered for farmers and is still for farmers as far as I'm concerned. My two grandfathers were farmers. One had a 40-acre farm southwest of Winterset, and the other one southeast of Winterset had a 200-acre farm. So I know what farming is really all about. I know that it was horse-driven at one time. I have ridden as a small child on the back of a plow that was horse-drawn at one time and was converted into a uh, two-bottom tractor pulled plow. The same with a hay rake. So I know where farming is, and I also recall many, many statements, as of, and, and I continue to do that as I grow older, remembering the things my grandfather said about farming. They listened to WHO radio in Des Moines, Iowa, and there was always market talk on there. And the greatest bonus, today farmers, for a bonus, maybe will fly to Florida or Hawaii,
But now, uh, or excuse me, in the past, my grandfathers, the big bonus was is if they had a little extra corn that they weren't going to feed the sows, they'd take it to town. There was no marketing ability to it at all. If they had a little, they took it to town and accepted anything that they could get for it. And this was a great check, a few, bag, a few bags of groceries, a few Christmas presents, and this was a great, it meant a great deal to them. And it wasn't until I grew older that I found out that that didn't need to be, and it saddened me. So I guess uh, I have a philosophy uh, which is similar to yours. Uh, I have a philosophy that is very strong-minded in the back pocket of a farmer, and that is that I'm going to do anything and everything that I can to educate the farmer so that he can stand on his own two feet in a more realistic way in the 20th century. It reminds me of the difference in personalities between my grandfathers. One of my grandfathers was very, very positive, and they knew each other, and the other grandfather was pessimistic, still is to this day at 87 years old. Nothing goes right. Matter of fact, my mother just called from my hometown, which is Winterset, Iowa, this weekend, said he almost got in a fight with his landlord. She said if he hadn't been 87 years old, he'd have decked the guy. <laughs> That's the French in me, I guess. But they were. One was positive and one was pessimistic. And they met together occasionally at the family reunions. And it'd always be something like this, just after planting. Well, I, I got my corn in, and, and uh, I planted more this year. It looks like it's going to be a pretty good crop, a good year. We've got adequate moisture in the ground. And my granddad would say, uh, boy, I tell you, we've got too much moisture in the ground. This stuff isn't going to get, get on its way very well. And then about July, we'd have another family reunion around Independence Day. And my positive grandpa would say, uh, by gosh, it's, it's, it's dry, and we need, we need the sunlight from that adequate moisture we had in June. And my pessimistic granddad would say, it's too dry. It's, we're not going to have a crop. Well... <clears throat> My positive grandfather got tired of my negative grandfather. And they always went duck hunting, OK? They'd always travel about 50 miles and do some duck hunting every year together. And my grandfather said, this year I'm going to change his attitude. And so my positive grandfather bought a dog. And he named him Ralph. And it was a goose dog. And he taught him, it was a Chesapeake, taught him to go out and, and fetch the goose after he killed it on the water. He taught him in a special way. And so that time of year rolled around, they went out, and uh, they were sitting in the blind and doing their positive, negative things again. And my grandfather, my positive grandfather, shot a goose, and it landed in the water. He said, Ralph, go out there and get that goose. And Ralph went out on the lake, walked across the water, picked up the goose, and walked back across the lake. My negative grandfather said, I knew that dog couldn't swim. <laughs> and I think that's very, very true of the farm community. Uh, because we have to deal with so many acts of God, uh, risks in weather, we can become very positive and negative. And I think that's what's influenced me the most about NFO is it is a bunch of positive people who are positively, in a, re, in a real way, dealing with the realities of marketing in this world and trying to put a fair share of it in their pocket. And that's what I'm all for. My uh, magazine, which I will announce right now, Sunflower World, to anybody that's growing 10 acres or more, we've gone to a controlled circulation. And it will be free to farmers who submit their name and address, along with zip code. Uh, if they grow, like I say, 10 acres or more to receive it. Uh, Tim uh, is going to be submitting names of those who have signed up and will submit those who are going to sign up in Sunflower Acreage to my staff so you can start receiving this uh, monthly. Now, you think it may be a lot of company news if you've never seen Sunflower World before, but it's not. If you've read it at all, you'll find out that it's market information, and it deals with a philosophy that Tim liked, and that's why he came to me. You might be also happy to know that this magazine is not owned by me. It's owned by a group of farmers in North Dakota. 
So what we're doing is for the farmer. It's not owned by any of the seed companies that advertise in it. I would like to spend a minute on the history of America's farming. And that is, is that it's been geared to production alone. And I'd like to talk about the psychology of that in my speech today. Mass food production, especially since 1972 and 1973, we've really geared ourselves this way. Our hybrid uh, research has come through for us. We have a lot more corn uh, uh, yield than we used to in, in the amount of bushels. I remember my grandfather was very happy with 70 bushel yield. That was a top year for him. And now it's 150 or we get the pessimistic attitude. We have bigger machinery only conducted by the John Deere's and the International Harvesters and the Cases, all of which I know are from the Quad Cities who aren't farmer oriented as far as I'm concerned. We have less cost because of this, this farm machinery because it takes less labor to do the farming job that we used to do years ago. We have land development. We have conservation. We have chemical, pesticide, herbicide. All of these kind of modernizations that have made the food industry what it is today. And production is a full-time business. There is no doubt about that. And it's still being talked about. From early spring, basically, middle of March, to, and many times in North Dakota, it's still going on to this day, trying to get some sunflower out of the field. It goes on till about January 1st, respectively speaking. And so every farmer is geared in production. Production, production, production. It requires special intelligence and skills to be setting in the seat that you're setting in today. It requires mechanical skill. It requires hard labor. And it requires a management of personnel and maintenance, as well as the economics of farming. And these things have to be. It takes this to be a farmer in America. It's the major part of farming. That's production. However, in terms of business theory, it's not the major portion of profit. It's not the money maker. Production is production in farming, but it's not profit centered. Manufacturing something is not profiting. It's manufacturing. And in business we call it an expense. Those are the red lines. Manufacturing and production are expenses. I know of uh, two individuals who used to have a truck and they went down to Texas and loaded vegetables on it many times and it happened to be a, a few years ago that the season for watermelons was very good and they were bringing watermelons back up into Iowa. They'd take the truck down there, buy the watermelons for a dollar and drive them back into Iowa and then relocate them in various uh, grocery stores. And they'd haul several loads and they were buying them for a dollar in Texas and selling them for a dollar in Iowa. Uh-huh. One of the co-drivers of this outfit looked at Ray and he said, Ray, I don't think we're making any money at this. And uh, Ed says, you know, I've been giving that a great deal of thought this season. Well, what have you come up with? We need a bigger truck. Obviously, profit is tied to marketing, period, the end. It's in a class by itself. Production and marketing are two totally separate entities of an operation. For instance, John Deere, and I think this is a very good example. John Deere in the Quad Cities has massive, and maybe some of you have visited this complex, has massive production areas, assembly lines for these combines and tractors and plows and snowmobiles and, and what have you, and they go down the line. But I guarantee you, if you walked up to the foreman of that production line and asked him what this combine cost, he wouldn't be able to tell you. And that might surprise you, but he wouldn't know. If you walked up to the foreman's manager of that building and said, what does this combine cost? He wouldn't know. And if you went to the manager's boss 
of the unit of all the combine production and you ask him what can the farmer buy this for, he wouldn't know. But there's one thing he would know and that would be the expenses of that combine, what it took to build it. That's why John Deere has a totally separate building, a total group of offices only devoted to marketing their production. They have a whole different staff of salesmen and personnel that compute those expenses and then generate a, a fair, or a, I shouldn't really call it fair, <laughs> but compute a margin of profit and that, that will be what that combine sold for. Now we've heard that story before, haven't we? But that is the way it's done. I would like to stress that in years when the farmer